Hello, my name is Jasmine Abston, and I'm here to talk about the social cognitive theory. I chose this theory because it's way too complex, and I wanted to further my understanding of it, and hopefully I can help my peers and any viewers out there understand it as well. During this presentation, I will discuss the history and evolution of social cognitive theory, what makes it unique, its 10 constructs, and limitations to the theory. Social cognitive theory derived from Robert Sears' social learning theory, and it was not until 1962 when Albert Bandura, who was a venerable psychologist, modified social learning theory, and it's what we now know, of course, as the social cognitive theory. Bandura was very influential in the fields of behaviorism and also cognitive psychology. The theory posits that individual learning occurs within a social context. One key principle of social cognitive theory is observational or vicarious learning. There is a dynamic interaction between person, environment, and behavior. Basically, there's an emphasis on social influence and the impact on both internal and external factors. And finally, in 1986, the self-efficacy construct was added, as well as reciprocal determinism. I will discuss those constructs later in the presentation. But please keep in mind that social learning theory was heavily based on behaviorism and operant conditioning, while social cognitive theory includes elements of both behaviors and cognitive approaches. There are a number of things that make social cognitive theory unique. First, self-efficacy, goals, and outcome expectancies all affect how likely someone is to change his or her behavior. Individuals facing adversity can still persevere when they have a sense of agency, which is defined as an active role of their own behavior change process. Unlike many health behavior theories, social cognitive theory considers how people maintain their behavior within a social environment, something that we find very important in our field, public health. Secondly, the theory addresses past experiences and how they shape and determine whether or not a behavior will occur. Specifically, these, ex these past experiences influence expectations, expectancies, and reinforcement and of course the reasons as to why the person engages or doesn't engage in that behavior. According to the theory, there are 10 factors to consider for behavior change. I will briefly discuss as well as operationalize each. Individual characteristics or internal factors include self-efficacy, behavioral capability, expectations, expectancy, self-control, and emotional coping. Environmental or external factors include vicarious learning, situation, reinforcement, and reciprocal determinism. Self-efficacy is a person's competence in his or her ability to perform a behavior. It is the most powerful predictor of behavior. This diagram represents the four sources of self-efficacy. The first is mastery experience, also listed here is performance accomplishments. That is the successful completion of a task. The second is vicarious experience or observing others. The third is social and verbal persuasion, people telling you what they believe you're capable of. And finally, physiological or the actions to control emotional arousal. So those four sources can increase your self-efficacy, thus leading to a change in behavior. As a health educator, you would use the following steps to increase self-efficacy for program participants or clients. First, encourage them to create small achievable goals to improve mastery. Second, you can involve mentors, role models, include role play, training, workshops, conferences into your program in order to increase their observational learning. Third, you always want to ensure participants or clients have a social support system for encouragement. And last, it is imperative that you reduce any unnecessary stressors and to teach healthy coping skills. 
The second construct is behavioral capability, which is the individual's level of knowledge and skill related to the behavior. In order to perform a behavior successfully, you must know what you're doing and how to do it. Putting this into action is very simple. We want to provide both informational and hands-on training to participants and clients. For instance, if a health educator is teaching pregnant women how to breastfeed, the women should understand why they should avoid certain medications while breastfeeding, which is informational based. And they may also need to demonstrate proper nursing positioning, which would be hands-on training. Expectations are what the individual thinks will happen after engaging in a behavior. As I stated earlier, expectations are primarily based on past experiences, which play a significant role in future behavior. If an individual has negative sentiments towards performing a health-promoting behavior, then health educators should indicate the many likely positive outcomes and benefits. For instance, Getting someone to quit smoking is challenging because it may relieve stress for that person. However, if you explain that smoking causes cardiovascular and respiratory stress to the body, it will allow the person to reconsider and maybe they'll think that or realize that smoking is not really a stress reliever at all. Like expectations, expectancies derive from past experiences but are related to the values the individual associates with the behavioral outcome. If a person believes the outcome would be positive, then he or she is likely to perform that behavior. For this construct, you would identify what incentives could motivate the participants to choose the healthier behavior. In addition, you would also find true functional outcomes for change. For instance, certain members of the program may express more interest in short-term versus the long-term benefits of changing their health. Self-control is how much control the individual has over making a behavior change. Going back to mastery experience, one of the sources of self-efficacy, we also want to emphasize goal setting for self-control too. Setting goals seems to be a recurring element throughout the social cognitive theory. Setting goals promotes autonomy and allows the individual to make incremental changes and accomplishments. Health educators should also provide constructive feedback as it will likely encourage the individual, make them do better. Evaluation through self-reflection, such as keeping a journal, blog, or video to document progress and success is also another useful tip for health educators. And fourth, a social support system is always necessary to encourage participants. Emotional coping is the final internal factor for social cognitive theory. It is an individual's ability to deal with emotions related to behavior change. Changing a behavior may evoke ambivalence, distress, helplessness, or even hopelessness. Oftentimes, poor coping skills cause individuals to revert back to poor health habits. This is common in people suffering from addictions and obesity. To mitigate those feelings, it is vital that health educators teach stress management skills, which encompasses many activities, like relaxation techniques, mindfulness, or even therapy and counseling. Ultimately, you want to reduce their stressors and help them to develop effective, healthy problem-solving skills when they feel challenged by changing their behavior. Vicarious or observational learning is an environmental external factor of social cognitive theory. This is learning by observing others' behavior and the consequences following that behavior. A participant can watch someone else and reproduce the same behavior. If someone sees another person perform that behavior successfully, then he or she is also likely to succeed as well. According to social cognitive theory, this concept is conditional. The modeling individual must be a credible, relatable source if you take a look at that picture of the nurse and the child, I mean, I know this is a toddler, but please pretend this is a typical inquisitive child. Uh, that child may admire the nurse because nurses care for the sick. In this case, the nurse is a role model to that young child. And after watching the nurse thoroughly wash her hands, the child will imitate this behavior, thus developing proper hand washing skills. Situation involves the social and physical environment in which the behavior takes place. 
as well as the individual's perception of those fa factors. For this construct, health educators should correct any misperceptions in order to promote health behavior change. An example would be an elderly man who chooses not to use condoms. He may, he may believe that the elderly population is at less of a risk for sexually transmitted diseases and HIV AIDS. We know that this is not true. According to the Center for Disease Control, people ages 50 and older account for one-fourth of the HIV AIDS population. The risk is increasing. And offering alternatives does not apply to this situation because condom, condom use and abstinence are the only methods that prevent STDs and HIV AIDS. And since we're on the topic of sexual health, um, this would be a completely different scenario involving young adult women. Uh, they may not believe they could take oral contraceptives because they may forget or whatever the case may be. Um, a discussion of different types of contraceptives and those options to women would be an example for providing health promoting alternatives. Reinforcement could be the positive or negative internal or external responses to a behavior. Positive reinforcement is giving what individuals like when they have performed, performed the desired behavior. Negative reinforcement is removing what individuals do not like when they have performed the desired behavior. It is important to note that negative does not necessarily mean bad, it is just the removal of an unpleasant stimulus. There are three types of reinforcement. These concepts by now should look very familiar to you. The first is direct reinforcement or operant conditioning, which are the results directly occurring after the behavior. The second is vicarious reinforcement or observational learning, which occurs when someone imitates another person's behavior and that behavior has already been reinforced. And the final type is self-reinforcement or self-control, in which a person controls his or her behavior by self-reward or punishment. In an episode of The Big Bang Theory, there's a very comical example of positive reinforcement. Sheldon trains Penny by giving her chocolate when she does something right, or at least what he considers to be right. He actually references B.F. Skinner, a psychologist and behaviorist, while alluding to operant conditioning as well. Reciprocal determinism is the culminant construct of social cognitive theory. It is the actual process where the individual makes behavior change based on individual characteristics, social and environmental cues, considering responses to stimuli, and accounting for adjustments and behavior maintenance. As I have mentioned throughout the lecture, identifying past experiences related to that behavior, development of personal skills and knowledge, as well as considering the social and environmental context in which they occur are essential to the likelihood of a behavior changing and the maintenance once that behavior is acquired. As expected, there are some limitations to using social cognitive theory. It assumes social and environmental changes will lead to personal change. This is not always true. Remember that Bandura quote from earlier in the presentation? It stated, if self-efficacy is lacking, people tend to behave ineffectually, even though they know what to do. Self-efficacy, as we know, is a powerful predictor of behavior. Someone could have a lot of reinforcement and even observational learning experiences, but if you lack the confidence in yourself, you will not engage in that healthy behavior. This can also lead to the lack of consideration for biological and hormonal predispositions that could potentially influence behavior, as opposed to what this theory is intimating. A third weakness is that there is no way to adequately measure the constructs and how they interplay, which perpetuates theory testing problems later on. Overall, social cognitive theory is extremely complex and too comprehensive, as it involves way too many constructs. Unlike the individual health behavior theories, this theory almost precludes program planners to form health behavior hypotheses using social cognitive theory. It would, it would be very difficult to apply all of those constructs to one public health problem for an effective program.
intervention. Here are a few resources that I use to complete my presentation. Thank you so much for viewing my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and I also hope you learned something from it.